Um, my story, I guess it will, I would have to say it started as a young child. And domestic violence was not something I've ever heard of. That wasn't a conversation we've had in our home, we've had in our family. Um, I was time, from time to time to see family members have arguments, but I just thought that was just part of being in a relationship. And even in my own home, I always said my dad didn't hit my mom, my dad didn't abuse my mom, my dad didn't, um, you know, raise his voice. He was just, to me, this calm person that just didn't like confrontation. Um, my mom, she was the more verbal, she was the more, you know, she's going to express how she feel about things. And because of my lack of uh, understanding what domestic violence was, I just felt like if there, if I did not see the actual hitting or fighting, that that was the only type of abuse that, that there was. And so as I got older, I realized that um, even in my relationship with my dad, he's always been in my life, but he was, he was just that type of person that you knew he loved you, but you didn't have to hear him say it. You just kind of understood that. My mom was more verbal about um, telling us she loved us or, hey, if anybody touch you or do anything to you, tell me, or she would periodically ask us about things. And we just kind of felt like, why is she asking us that? No, no. And she sometimes she would be very adamant about it. But one of the things I realized as I got older, when my mom and my dad got divorced, I was angry. And for some reason, I, was, I, I felt like I was angry at my mom because I felt like, well, what did you do? Why, why did he leave? And not even realizing um, some of the underlying issues because I didn't see it. I just felt like it didn't happen. And I remember um, I got pregnant at an early age. I was 15 years old. And my mom, she fussed, she, you know, whatever, and told me to get out, you know. But by the time I got to school, she called and said I can come back home. But for my dad, it was different. He said, the only thing I remember my dad saying was, what's his name and do he have a job? And I'm sitting there like, is that it? You know, like, aren't you going to fuss? Aren't you going to say, like, I wanted him to say more because then I felt like I, he showed me he cared. But I was, in that moment, I think it created something in me that an even bigger void because I really didn't know how my dad felt. You know, my dad didn't, we, I didn't see a healthy relationship growing up in home. I didn't see us doing things as family, my mom and dad doing things together or, or things that a lot of times I think if we ate dinner, most time my dad would come in after. And so for me, what was a healthy relationship? I didn't know. And so for years, I felt like I disappointed my parents. And because I felt that disappointment, that's when shame came in for me. I was the youngest of all my classmates to be pregnant, to have a child. So I started dealing with my own rejection. I think I was about 13. And that's when I met, um, well, that's when I met my, my first, my children's father. And so we pretty much grew up together. Um, but it was almost like I was looking for something in him that I should have already had and looking for him to affirm some things that should have already been in place. And so, so I, re I, can, I guess I can remember the first instance um, of me being abused was when I was 16 years old. I can remember I had gotten out of school one day and I went, um, went to his sister's house and he wasn't there. So I remember walking around the street to my aunt's house. And so when I came back, it was like, where were you? Um, I came and you wasn't here. And that was the first time that he had ever put his hands on me. And in that moment, a lot of people would think, well, why didn't you just leave? Why, you know, if he did that, he was gonna do it again. But because I did not have knowledge of this, you know, I thought, Maybe subconsciously I thought that's how relationships are. People get into it, people fight. But it created, that was the place, it created a fear in me that, you know what, I didn't know how to react, so I just did nothing. I, I, I pretty much froze, like, did this just happen? 
And prior to that, there were no signs, at least I thought. Um, there was not, it wasn't jealousy, it wasn't where you going, why you didn't call me, call no. It was none of that, so I missed, I missed, I think that's how I missed it because I was looking for the, these, the usual signs that people will tell you and I missed it. And I didn't know anything about verbal abuse, uh, psychological, uh, sexual, financial. I didn't know anything about those parts. Only thing I could relate abuse to was the physical. And um, the physical was where it started for me. It didn't escalate from being verbally abused. It, 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 it wasn't little subtle things that were happening that should have gave me a sign that it was coming. It just kind of happened all of a sudden. And so um, that was the beginning of um, my experience with domestic violence. I remember um, being in high school, going from going to school every day to hardly going to school because I'm just really in a bad place. And even at this time, I had left my mom's home. I wasn't. I was staying with um, him and his sister. And so. I had got into really a deep place. It was like I, um, I didn't tell anybody what was going on. And in my mind, I was just hoping somebody would ask. But I remember my mom having a conversation with my mom and she asked, why did you stay so long? And I said, I don't know if that's something I can answer. I said, but I will tell you, I've never seen a healthy relationship. So I had nothing to model off of. And I said, and also, um, people don't realize that when people are going through abuse, like, they need so much support. They need people that are patient. They need people that are non-judgmental. And so for me, I felt like I was being, I was getting ultimatums from the abuser, and I was getting ultimatums from my family. So in that case, I did nothing. I just shut down. I functioned, but I didn't function. But um, over the years, even when that's the physical abuse kind of um, wasn't as much, but the verbal, it escalated. And I tell people, sometimes, depending on the situation, the verbal and the psychological is worse than the physical. Because the physical, is, it may hurt for a moment, but that pain kind of goes away, but the verbal and emotional continues to play in your mind. And that's the place where people don't understand where um, it's not that easy for women to walk away. And it's not that they like it, but it's because they've come accustomed to the dysfunction and that's how they function. And unless you've been in that situation, you will never truly understand the mindset of someone that's in an abuse relationship because for them, some of the things they do is their, is how they survive, is how they make it to the next day. When I got to the point, I would say maybe 2002, I was working um, at Jackson Hospital and I remember um, one of the coworkers, she was always come down to the department. She would talk to me about God and, and talk to me about, you know, are you in church? Are you going to church? And I said, and she would invite me to Fresh Anointing. And I said, I'm going. And, um, but son to come, I go, not go. And then she'll come back. Did you go to church? No, I didn't go. I'm going to come back. We did that probably for about a month. I just, but I, what, one thing I realized that I said, my life isn't getting any better, so I have to do something different. Um, but I was angry at God. And that was a, because before that I would go to church, but I pulled away because um, I remember asking God, where are you? Why aren't you helping me? You know, you see what I'm going through. So I became angry at God. And so I finally came to Fresh Anointing and um, I came that one time and I really liked it. And, but after that day, I didn't come back for about a month or so. And things had gotten crazy within that time. Me, um, it, it had gotten very crazy. I said, well, I got to do something. So I started coming, and I became intentional about coming.
Every time the doors opened, I was here. The church became my safe haven. I knew if I just got there, I didn't worry. I didn't think about nothing. Even though I know when I go home, it was a different environment. But when I came to church, it's just everything else was just blocked out. Um, I don't remember how long I was here um, before I just realized that, you know, God, I got to establish my own relationship with you. And so I remember going to uh, Pastor Cal and, and telling him about what happened. And he connected me with some other ladies in church. And he was the only, even though people may have known, but he was the only man I had ever opened up to about what was going on. And so he connected me with people in the church. Um, there was only one that I really made a connection with, which was Tawana Attitude. She has been with me like from just coming into the church broken in a bad place to where I am now. She has followed me on that journey. Um, she was the one when I'm having anxiety because um, my body had got so conditioned to know when there's gonna be a fight or an argument. Um, my body would just get very uneasy. My stomach would just get, um, start just turning and I would have to call her, look, I'm having anxiety, I'm having a good day, I need you to pray with me. Um, she would share words and prayer, and she did that for years. Um, there are times she would just tell me every time she said, you're coming out, you're coming out. And I held on to those words because I'm like, is it today? Is it tomorrow? You know what? I didn't know. But I know also that the enemy also wanted to create fear because even one of the times I said, I'm leaving, um, the enemy started saying, well, you're safer if you stay. Um, he may try to kill you. He may try to stalk you. He may, and so all those thoughts, and because of the fear, it kept me there five years longer. And so I remember um, watching the movie Esther, and that is really what gave me the last straw. Was like you got to get out. And I remember it was the part where she, um, uh, Mordecai, asked her to go before the king. And she went and she knew she had to be summoned and she knew that, you know, it could cost her her life by doing that. But the word she said was, um, if I perish, let me perish, but I'm going anyway. And those words just kind of rung in my ear, rung in my ear. Um, so that last time when um, he attacked me and in that last one, um, I think was the first time I had really major um, injuries because I had to go to the ER because um, I was hit in the back of the head with an iron and I had to get I think about 12 staples and I remember walking into my mom's house and my oldest daughter just started crying and I'm like I can't do this and so I made up my mind I said God whatever has to happen is this gonna happen but I'm walking away and that was May 9th of 2009 um, this year is going on 11 years um, that I walked away and did not turn back. And in 2013, um, I've always had a heart for women, and I always it was always like women always talk to me about things that are going on, and I'm thinking, Lord, if they only knew what I was going through, they wouldn't talk to me. But I realized God was doing something um, that I had not didn't have a clue about. And so in 2013 is when I decided to start a nonprofit organization called Women of Refined Gold. But at first I couldn't think of a name. I'm thinking of everything like purple something, whatever, purple flower. And I remember God reminded me about um, what he had spoken to me in 2007. And he took me to Job 23.10 that also talks about refining gold. And I said, I knew it had to be God because I didn't know the scriptures and I didn't know, um, I wanna never thought it was in there. And so um, God knew I didn't quite understand. So um, he broke it down. He said, gold goes through the process of purification. And in order for the impurities to be burnt off, it has to go through a high level of heat. And he said, you're gonna go through some things and you're gonna feel some things, but when you come out, you'll come out good as gold. And so I held on to that, not even knowing what 
that even meant or what I was supposed to do with that. And so I remember maybe it was a year later after I started, I met a guy and he said, my church wanted to know how gold goes through the process. And he said that the lady went out, she got the information, but really, what really stuck out to me in that conversation was the lady asked him, she said, well, how do you know when the gold is refined? And he said, when I can see myself in it. And in that moment, I realized what God was saying based off a question I asked him in 07, God, where are you? Why have you left me? And he was showing me, I never left you. You were gonna have to go through the process. You were gonna have to go through some things. Not all of it was gonna feel good, but if you keep trusting me, that you were gonna come out good as gold. And so that has been the very, um, I guess the essence of our existence or why we came into existence or why this organization was started. Um, I tell people it's not a faith-based organization, but I talk about what God did for me.